called the Four Star Power Point. I want to point out this little row of rodents that I brought, brought along here. And they're to show you some of the types of rodents, some of the colors, some of the formations that we have. And just starting from here, this opened just open this morning. This bird, it barely opened last for one day, but this is a repeat blooming species rose, Rosa rugosa. I ended up finding one of the hybrid perpetuals, the old garden roses. And you also, as we go down here, you might just notice I have one piece rose. One of the open up classic that opened up. Um, including, there's a one miniature, so you can note, note how much smaller they really are than our standard size roses. The ones in the middle here are generally like the florist type roses. And as we get down here, we go into the shrub roses. Okay, PowerPoint time. Okay, the American Rose Society has divided up the roses into various classes, and the whole idea is to separate them into groupings that describe their characteristics. So most of these pictures are taken in my yard. The main groupings, the, the larger separation, are the species in old garden roses and then the modern roses. So we'll start with the old garden roses. And a couple things just to mention is that you notice this um, darkened area across the top and all roses, all roses that we have originated in the northern hemisphere along that band. There are actually no native roses in the southern hemisphere. Does not mean that they don't grow them there. <laughs> uh, classifications that existed prior to 1867 are considered the old garden roses. And that is the year of the introduction of the first hybrid tea, which is the equivalent to the florist roses. We have 28 different classes and lots of different bloom forms. You notice that the upper left, we call that button center. We have the um, some of the old garden roses will actually have hybrid T form, like in the bottom and the middle, and other various shapes. So there's nothing exclusive about any particular class. Species rose is an example, is the one I start with and here is Rosa Blanda. This is native to Minnesota, it's actually native to the area in the northwest corner of the state that where I grew up. This is the rose that introduced me to roses. Notice it's got the red fall hips, which are pretty by themselves, and prolific bloom in the spring, and lots of fragrance. Another species rose that we hear about or read about in history is Rosa gallica officinalis and Rosa gallica versicolor. This is the um, roses out of Shakespeare and history. Another one that, to show you some of the variations in the species, Rosa fatina bicolor, also called Austrian copper. The roses are kind of a, an orange red, and the reverse side are yellow. And so when the wind hits them, you get, and <coughs> you get the effect of both colors. And you notice the yellow roses on the right. It, um, this is a sport sporting back to the original, which sometimes happens. I'm just going to hit a few of the other old garden roses so you can just get an idea of the types and the shapes. The painter's rose is the centrifolia, which is another one that's very common in old literature. The moss roses, if you notice, look carefully at the what we call mossing on the buds. And it's actually, if you run your hands up down them, your fingers down, it's a kind of a pine tarry smell. And um, so you both have the fragrance of the roses, and then you have this um, mossing effect and the fragrance of that as well. 
The Alba Roses are a little bit different in the sense that this is a king of Den in Denmark, and they are generally a little bit taller than some of the other old garden roses, and they're more tolerant of shape. So mine actually will go in partial shape. The bourbons uh, originated or found in what they call the Iowa bourbon. If they are a natural cross of a couple of roses, an old lush and another uh, species that was a specimen. And they basically have an arching effect. And what I'm showing you, um, Irene de Brabant is one of the more unusual colorings. And I had to add an additional rose. This is Great Western. It's a bourbon rose in the bourbon classification but it's one that I have found to be in the summer hardy. China roses gave us the repeat blooming that we were looking for in the early years. Uh, this is just one of the China's metabolis, which I actually grow in a pot and I have to really protect. Madame Hardy is a damask, good fragrance. It's called Madame Hardy not because it is so hardy, is because it was named after the wife of someone whose last name is Hardy. York and Lancaster, again, is another one of these that are from history in the English Wars. And if you look very carefully on the left side, you will see a couple petals that are darker. Sometimes it has half of the petals dark, sometimes it will be pretty well blended. Uh, it, it's variable, but it's called the York and Lancaster Rose. Rose de Reche is a Portland, which is similar, but it is oftentimes in shows, rose shows, it is ends up winning the most fragrant class. The hybrid Gallicus is more one class that we're quite familiar with here in Minnesota because we have a lot of hardiness in this class. Ion Blanchard is a rose that I found first in a California rose show. And I looked at it, and you look at those little blotches on the petals, I thought there was something wrong with it. And then I started looking at the table and I realized that there were several more of them. And I looked at it and I said to myself, it's a Gallica. Why don't we grow that in Minnesota? So I started ordering it. I ordered it from two different nurseries. One of them gave me the wrong thing, and the other one gave me the correct one. So I have it, and I love it. Gallicus come in lots of different uh, colors, and they often refer to them as the wild Gallicus. This is Camo. It is wonderfully striped. And one of my favorites also in this class is a Leica. This was brought back from Leningrad by an explorer from the United States who came from South Dakota, Niels Hansen. And in one of his writings, he actually wrote how to pronounce it, the I is in life. And it can get up to 10 feet tall. Most of the galleries stay at three to four feet, which makes them great landscape plants. Then we get into some, just a few other old garden roses because I wanted to show you the full range of what they came in. Champlain's Pink Cluster, again, not hardy in Minnesota, but I grow it in a pot and give it new protection. Lovely clusters. Tea Roses, Duchess de Brabant, uh, one of our presidents used to wear this in his buttonhole. Very nice, very pretty rose. And then I'm getting into the hybrid perpetuals. This is the class of roses. The, I have one over there, the one in the small bottle the closest to me. And these are the, the forerunners to the modern hybrid teams. The ones that I call florist roses because most people understand what I'm talking about then. This is in my yard. I grow them along fences generally in areas where I get adequate snow cover in the wintertime. Snow plows do a wonderful job. The only thing is that as the winter goes along, I sometimes have to put uh, poles with flags on top of them 
so that when they come and level off the top of the snowbank, I don't hear this domino crack effect when they hit the, the fence and start taking it down. Um, it's happened two or three times that way. But the snow cover is adequate for these roses. Randy Violet was once considered the bluest of them. Very nice fragrance, pretty gross. Sedonia, it's uh, obviously it's an extremely pretty rose, lovely color. Ferdinand Picard, the nice delicate stripes. And then in addition to that, it has a raspberry fragrance. Baron Gerard Delaine, you notice the white edges on it. They were experimenting and coming up with unique things that would sell to the public, mainly in Europe at the time, probably about the 1850s. The most famous of the hybrid perpetuals is the rose we call American Beauty. And many times we see the American Beauty depicted as a red rose, it never was red. Uh, it has always been this vibrant pink. It's a rose that, this is also American Beauty, it's a rose that actually changed the way we were arranged. Do flower arranging. Because for one of the first times we had a rose that actually grew on straight, stiff stems. And it allowed people to make looser arrangements. Whereas in the past, before that, most of the roses had weak stems and they would cram them together into a vase in order to make them stand up. American Beauty released us from that constraint. It also became one of the most famous roses in the world. The modern roses. This is my backyard in a few years back. The modern roses are composed of these classes. The hybrid trees and the floras, floribundas, miniatures, mini floras, the large flower climbers, and the shrubs, both classic and modern. And I'll show you just a few examples of each one. Marilyn Monroe is one of the newer hybrid trees, wonderful form, and as like I said, it looks very much like the rose you buy in the forest. Red Intuition is a newer one of the hybrid teas, and it has these pink and red stripes. And it's very distinctive. Firefighter is one of the newer, one of the newest of the reds, and it also it looks like the florist florist rose, but it also is well known for having an outstanding fragrance. The difference between the grandifloras and the hybrid teas is demonstrated here by Dick Clark. Uh, the grandifloras will often bloom in clusters, otherwise they're fairly indistinguishable from the other hybrid teas. Get into the floribundas, which are cluster flower. In other words, you'll find it as a spray, a grouping of roses on one stem. And they are a cross of the hybrid teas and polyanthus, which is another lesser minor class of roses. Then we get into the modern roses, the miniatures. This is Sweet Mally. Over there we have black jade on the table. And they're not just a bonsai version of the, the larger roses, even though that's what they look like. They found somewhere a deviation, a rose that was tiny, and then others have taken and crossed that with numerous roses to create this class of roses. It um, has expanded significantly. Uh, a fellow that most of us are familiar with in the rose world is Jerry Olson, who was one of our mentors. And he told me that in the 1960s, when we had uh, American Rose Society convention in the Twin Cities, that he was told that these would never amount to much. 
and he, they hardly saw a reason before we having a separate class with him and Michelle. That's changed. They're probably very, very competitive and almost equal in the number of roles that we see Rome. And they come in lovely colors and variations that are startling at times. This is called Twist and Shout, <coughs> yellow and pink. And this is Chess's favorite. And they also come in the standard, almost the hyper T form of red. We have added another class of roses into the mix. They're called mini florets. And these are like halfway between between the um, miniatures and the floor bundles. And they're so they're basically a little bit larger. And here's a couple. First choice and right to touch. Modern roses also include those that have the tendency to get very tall. Here we have one above and beyond, which is hybridized by a friend of ours, David Slezak. I believe I have one sample of that. They're almost, it's almost done blooming for this cycle, and, but I found one. Um, this actually points out that within the genetics of the rose world, we have a lot of potential variations, and it just depends on which ones that nature has decided to show us with the new sequence. Another one of the large flower climbers is Cherry Frost, which I also have over there. It's hybridized up in the Duluth area. Those two are totally 100% hardy in our climate. Modern roses, then I would get into the shrub which used to be the catch-all term for everything and anything that was not in the first groups of classes. Uh, now we are at the point where we are dividing the shrub classes into smaller groupings. Um, first of all, we have the classic roses, and these are the, the main varieties. These are the hyperergoses. F.J. Brokenhorst is one of them. The one thing is, I first grew this rose when I thought that only roses were hybrid teas. I added this as a um, deterrent to children running through my rose beds. <laughs> they work very well. But it's a sense that it has um, earned its own place in the yard. Another one is also a Ragosa. This is Moore's Strike Ragosa, hybridized by Moore in California. Um, this is the only Strike Ragosa that we know of. In, also in the class of modern shrubs, we have the Cordicei, hybridized in Canada. John Cabot is one of them. I have this one on the right side of my arch in the backyard. And on the left side, I have a little bath. And they're both hybrid Cordicei, or Cordicei now. And the other two classes in the classic shrubs are the hybrid musk and the hybrid Mauricei, which generally are not as hardy, but these two are. The ghosts and the Cordicei are hardy in our climate. And then we have the second and the last group of the modern shrubs and the modern roses, the modern ones. And I'm not going to get into dividing it, but just within the last year or two here, the American Rose Society has decided, decided that it is appropriate to divide this class as well into new classes. And we have not yet reassigned the roses to these groups. Emily Carr is a Canadian hybridized rose, probably five, six feet, and wonderfully hardy, and just a beautiful shrub rose. Eyes for You is one of another of the newer varieties that we can grow that uh, has characteristics that are really fun 
to look at. Out of the 49th parallels, grouping of Canadian roses is Canadian shield. Another all these Canadian <coughs> student art. And I have to put in at least one of the English roses because these are popular. Most of the time they're fragrant. They are, in my yard, I consider them borderline hardy, but they're well worth growing. And I have to also add another rose that, which is basically my last rose here. It's Chinook Sunrise. It's uh, the 49th parallel rose. Then just one after that that we haven't been able to track down yet, um, which is the Aurora Borealis. And this one, Chinook Sunrise, is in my yard about close to seven feet. It arches, so the, the canes uh, provide a, just a beautiful display. And that's what I have for you today. Thank you.